Hi, I'm Niall Stanage from The Hill, and you're very welcome to our latest special event. My guest today is Katie Tour. Katie is probably best known as the anchor of her own show, Katie Tour Reports, which airs every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern on MSNBC. She first came to broad national prominence covering Donald Trump's 2016 campaign for the presidency. The book she wrote about that experience, Unbelievable, became a New York Times bestseller. And she has now reached the bestseller lists for a second time with her new book, Rough Draft, a memoir that covers a lot of ground, including politics, journalism, motherhood, and family. Katie, welcome. Thanks for having me, Niall. Good to see you. Good to see you too. A pleasure. So I just want to start off with uh, something that struck me reading the book. Um, as it opens, um, you talk about the pandemic, and I was slightly surprised to learn that you had serious thoughts of quitting journalism at that time. By the end of the book, that prospect seemed to have receded slightly, but where are you on that question at the moment? That is a very good question, and it's something that I don't have a concrete answer to, and that's not because I don't love journalism, I do. It's just a convergence of two issues, one of them being that we cover very dark stuff in succession um, and it seems like it's getting darker and darker and it can be hard on your mental health. Uh, you know, even just today, we're reporting on the assassination of a world leader. This is after Ukraine and the pandemic and the political divisions and these, you know, nonstop mass murders that we're seeing at schools or supermarkets, 4th of July parades in this country, big intractable problems that don't seem to be getting any better. So it can be a bit demoralizing. And then on top of that, um, there was just a Gallup poll out today that shows that the trust in, in media, newspapers and television is you know, hitting an all time low. People don't trust us, they don't believe us. And it makes me wonder if this job as I'm currently doing it is effective, uh, but if it's doing more harm than good. I don't have a good answer for that. Mm. So uh, those thoughts linger in the back of my mind. Sure. They linger though, because I, I do love it and I do think it's important and I'm hoping to find a way to, to better communicate with people. Sure, and I think a lot of us share that um, ambivalence, but uh, I hope you stick with it. Now, the book is in many ways very intimate and, and raw and knowing you a little bit, I suspect you might have been reluctant to reveal some of the things you revealed in it. But I do want to get to the kind of emotional heart of it. And that's going to involve me summarizing things that are by their nature complex and delicate and, and tricky. So I'll, I'll do my best here. There, it covers a lot of ground, as I said in the introduction. But one of the core facets of it is your relationship with your father. And there are three salient points that I'll try to summarize. One is when you were a kid, your father and your mother were genuinely pioneering helicopter journalists. They got footage of a lot of big news events, um, the O.J. Simpson chase, the L.A. riots, and so forth. Second salient fact is that your father is transgender. Your father Dad was Bob when you were growing up, and Dad is now Zoe. The third salient fact, and the most difficult one to get into probably, is that you recount in the book your father being physically abusive of you and your mother, and I presume your brother, though you don't, you don't detail that, that element so much. One of the most uh, vivid but striking episodes in the book um, occurs in your high school senior year and you confront your father after he's given a sort of volley of verbal abuse to your mother and he hits you in the mouth and you write that you remember the taste of blood. Um, that must have been a difficult thing to write about I would imagine because I presume you have to relive it in the writing about it. And were there other instances like that in your upbringing? It was difficult to write about. The whole book was hard to, in some ways, hard to put down. Um, and it was hard because at 
times it wasn't hard at all and it was quite fun and magical. Um, and that's kind of what makes the story difficult is that it, it can be both magical and exciting and adventurous and fun and loving and also quite scary. And so talking about that instance with my father when I was in high school, um, there had been, you know, there had been episodes of violence or, or threats of violence earlier than that. Um, and this was kind of a crescendo where I, I just was tired of it. And, um, you know, mostly tired of the way that my dad treated my mother and, and just the yelling, you know, the nonstop verbal abuse uh, that was sometimes coupled with physical stuff, but mostly the nonstop mm. verbal abuse. And I, I'm just tired. And I, I pushed back and I said, you know, get the heck out of here. And he lost control with me in that moment. Um, yeah. So how do you tell a story about somebody who was a true pioneer who changed the, the journalism business for the good and for the for the bad, but also tell the full story, which is the person was also good and bad. It, it's it's difficult to confront it. Sure. And you make clear that you do love your father and that comes out a number mm -hmm. of times, both because you say so explicitly. And um, there's another episode where you're actually in labor with your first child or giving birth to your first child and you cry out for your dad at that point. My dad was always the go-to person in any emergency. If I scraped mm. my knee, my dad would fix it. If I had a question about, you know, not feeling well, my dad would have an answer. My, if I was upset about a boy, I would call my dad and my dad would talk me through it. I mean, he was always the, the number one person that, that I had in my life that would help me solve problems. Mm. Um, but the, the issue with, with him, and I say him because I'm talking about the past, um, was that he was a hero, but he was also the harm. You know, mm. in some cases, it, he would be fixing you up after he hurt you. And that would literally happen with my mother. He threw something at her and it broke her glasses and cut her eyebrow. And I walked in on him patching her up, you know, at, applying a bandage mm. or sewing her, her eyebrow up. And that's what makes the person so complicated. He was amazing in an emergency, but he caused the emergencies some of the time. Just one other point mm -hmm. on this, uh, on the issue of your relationship with your father, and then we'll move into more conventional journalism and politics areas. Um, we have an audience that probably follows media news and journalism news quite closely. And Sometimes the fact that your, your father is uh, transgender has been written about and, and she has given interviews about it and so on and so forth. But often it seems to me that that gets reduced to sort of Katie Turr's dad's transgender and they don't get on. As if there is a straight line of causality between those two things. And one of the things that the book really brings out is that that's really not the issue or certainly not the issue from your perspective, right? I mean, you write about what sounds like a very painful conversation when you're expressing supportiveness for your dad's transition, but your dad at that point doesn't seem willing at all to acknowledge the realities that we have just been talking about. And you write that you feel that your dad at that point wants history to be expunged or, or to play a a, a get out of gender free card that you didn't know existed. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so, you know, my dad was very public about the transition and she gave a lot of interviews about it. And in the interviews, she would often say that I wasn't supportive of it or I had an issue with the transition, worried that it would hurt my career, et cetera. And I didn't get involved in any of that because. I knew it wasn't true and also I just didn't want to I didn't want to reveal the real reason which was that we didn't get along because my dad was abusive and I wanted to come to terms with that I wanted to confront it with my dad and the and the point where where I I tried to force the issue was when she told me that she was transgender, she said, you know, this is where all my rage comes from and don't worry, it's all going to be gone. And I, I took that opportunity to say, okay, fine, that's great. Let's move on. Let's, let's clear the air. Let's do this together. But let's talk about the stuff that happened in the past because you might say Bob Turr is dead and Bob Turr might be dead to you, but Bob Turr isn't dead to me. Bob Turr is my father and 
and Bob Turd did a lot of good things, but Bob Turd also did a lot of bad things. And I need to, I need to process it with you to, to believe that the person you're becoming is a new person mm. inside and out. Um, and so I didn't want to get into that in public. I didn't think it was anyone's business. I didn't think it was necessary to, I don't want to, I don't want to drag my dad down mm. the way that I kind of felt my dad was dragging me down. Um, but then there was a documentary made about my family and the documentary went into all this abuse and it was out there publicly. And I find my, found myself in the middle of the pandemic, you know, wondering if I should go on with my career and wondering if it was something that I wanted to do or it was, or if it was something that I, you know, was fated to do because of my parents, because of what they did. And I also found myself a bit, um, superstitious Niall because my parents careers fell apart when mm. my dad was 38 I turned 38 okay uh and to to confront all of it to figure it all out to find out where I was going I realized that I needed to confront all the things in, in my past mm. and frankly it's a hell of a story and I, I think it's you know worth knowing <laughs> no matter sure. who you are because it's fascinating and it's a tale of it's a true American story of rags to riches, and mm. it it's done through the lens of journalism, which is, you know, we're in the middle of a moment in, in our history where journalism is so necessary, more mm. necessary than ever, but also less trusted than ever. Right. And so I wanted to figure out why, and, and the book explores that. Right, absolutely. And I do want to stress that it's not just a journalism book or a politics book. I think it would be of a lot of interest to people who don't necessarily follow day-to-day -day politics or day-to-day -day media. Having said all that, you raised the topic of journalism, so let's get into that. One of the uh, sections of the book that I was um, nodding along maybe most vigorously with was when you were talking about, I think it was when your first book came out, you were doing events for it. And you came to this realization that at least some of your audience saw you as a teammate rather yeah. than as a journalist. And you go on from there to talk about a, an essay, I guess, you wrote for the TV show, where you referred to the fact that journalism should make people uncomfortable if it's done properly, but that there seems to be an increasing tendency to seek comfort to seek the reaffirmation of what your you know the audience already believes um i agree with you for what that's worth but it's it's pretty depressing is it not it's very depressing and i think it's a big problem i mean mm. i especially after the last book and after the last campaign i got people you know saying thank you for fighting for me and while i found it um I found it uh, humbling that people saw me in that light. I also found it a bit disturbing because mm. I wasn't fighting for anybody. I was fighting for the truth and facts. And, and it just so happened that Donald Trump was on the other side of truth and facts <laughs> a lot of the time. And I was trying to make that clear. It wasn't fighting for any particular political party. Um, and, I, and I wanted that to be um, known to my viewers that you don't want me fighting for your political party because there might come a day where you don't agree with it any longer right. and you'll think hey I want a, an unbiased journalist or I want a journalist who will be fair mm. uh, to both sides and you don't want a teammate in that role it's it's not good for you it's not good for our society it's certainly not good for our democracy there are places where you can get that but you should you should want there to be a healthy number of nonpartisan, biased toward the facts journalists out there who can mm. tell you what's really going on without their own personal opinions intervening or mm. getting in the way. And so I tried to make that clear and I found it a difficult thing to convey to a lot of people out there who just felt like, I guess they felt like the moment was so scary and so dire with Donald Trump and the presidency that that they needed to, to seek comfort in somebody who they felt like was fighting a, fighting the good fight. I mean, on one level, it's an understandable impulse. Yeah, but of course. I also think, to me at least, those dynamics seem to be kind of accelerating all the time mm -hmm. sometimes. And I'm not sure 
Honestly, I'm not sure that any of us have completely clean hands because we're all aware of these dynamics. The piece that you wrote and you said you, you, know, you talked about this on the TV show, expecting at least some kind of resonance or some reaction, and it got almost none because it was, I would suspect, too nuanced and not you know, pounding the drum loudly enough for one side or the other. Is it difficult not to get not for, for that dynamic not to exert a kind of magnetic force on journalism to pull it. I think, it's really, I think you're right, and I think you've hit on something, and it's one of the reasons why I have deleted Twitter, because I think Twitter is something that will, you know, even if you're just checking it, um, if you're just scrolling through it at a commercial break, as I sometimes mm. would do, I think you'll inevitably read one person's comment, and mm. that person's comment will get into your head, and inadvertently it might start to shade the, the way you talk about a subject. And mm. sometimes it can be helpful. Sometimes it's pointing out a nuance that maybe you didn't see or, or correcting you on something that you had gotten wrong. But a lot of the times it was just expressing a, a, um, a, a guttural rage mm. that wasn't helpful for the conversation or is not helpful for the conversation. So I think mm. it's important to try to shelter yourself from that sort of influence. And, and it's one of the reasons why I got rid of Twitter. I just Mm -hmm. No, I, I just thought it wasn't it wasn't making me a better journalist. It was making me a a, a blunter journalist. And I don't sure. mean blunt as in telling the truth. I mean blunter as in um, not surgical with sure. with what's going on. And 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 the, the the reality is the times we live in are very complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, and not not everyone is all bad or all good. Not one one party isn't all great and all and all knowing and, and perfect and the other party isn't all evil it's just that's not the way it works and especially when you're talking about policy beyond some of the more divisive issues um we're talking about just other policy that that congress gets done you want to be able to to push back on on whomever you have on your television show whether or not they had a have an r or a d in front of their name and i mean talking of television shows i can kind of imagine a, a hypothetical viewer in my ear right now when you talk about Twitter, and I think Twitter is maybe the worst example of something that pulls people toward the extremes, but I'm imagining this voice in my ear now saying, well, what about cable news? Isn't, you know, whether people yeah. love MSNBC, hate MSNBC, love Fox, hate Fox, isn't cable news a vector for some of the stuff that we're talking about? Listen, I understand. I think that's a fair question uh, or a fair comment to bring up. And I and I think the, the important thing that, that I'm trying to do with my show and that we try to do in the dayside hours is not have an opinion, you know, and, mm. and, and that's not to say not be honest and, and and, you know, give both sides equal weight when maybe both sides don't deserve equal weight or maybe when there's more than just two sides to an issue. Mm. But it's to establish credibility as in as in not just saying one party is all good or one party is all bad, establish credibility and a reliance on the truth and on facts and on trying to understand an issue. Mm -hmm. That way, when you are calling out someone or some party for something, for not acting or for being hypocritical, um, you have the authority to do so. If you're mm -hmm. always attacking one side relentlessly, and that's the only position you take, you lose your credibility on that. Uh, you, yeah. you lose your credibility period, period because you're just seen as somebody who's out to get the other side. I think this was, some, this was, was something that happened with Donald Trump. Mm. We, in the media, and I say we royally, mm -hmm. would you know, hang on to every single tweet that he would put out there, big or small. And it was difficult because he was unlike any other president. And Sean Spicer said tweets were political, were presidential statements. So you, you know, how, do you take them seriously or do you not take them seriously? It was very difficult to navigate that. Sure. But hanging on to everything and blowing everything up in a nuclear way made it seem like we were only out to get Donald Trump. And I think that hurt our credibility in the long mm. run. Mm. And do you think we're still suffering the consequences of that with the audience, by which I mean the audience writ large? I do, and I think that there's, you know, there's 80 million people in this country who don't vote. That's a that's a big, sizable chunk of the country who may not might not be paying attention to mm. the news on a day to day basis, or they might just think that what they their participation in our democracy doesn't matter. 
Um, I think there are also a lot of viewers out there who are gettable viewers, consumers of, of television news information um, that are turned off by um, the screaming. And mm. I'd like to find a way to talk to them. Talking of Donald Trump, we only have a, at this point a, a few minutes left for a couple of final questions. You did cover him so closely in 2016. The story of how you did is uh, an entertaining story in itself, how you first got on that beat, but I let people read either or both of your books to find, uh, to find the answer to that one. But given you've covered him so closely, you are uh, as good a judge of his intentions as anyone else. Do you think he's going to run again? So I don't have any, um, you know, concrete reporting on this. I can't tell you one way or another. And I also can't tell you what he's thinking. Uh, but from my reporting on him over many years now, mm -hmm. I find it, I find the question that sticks in my head is, does he want to hand over the power as the titular head of the Republican Party to somebody else? Does he want to hand it over to Ron DeSantis, who seems mm -hmm. like the front runner right now? And from what I know of Donald Trump, my mind says no. Obviously, I'm not in his mind, so you know he'll decide for himself. Sure. <laughs> but I just I can't imagine him. He's so powerful right now. I can't imagine him giving that up so easily. Mm. And you relate in the book your experience of covering January the sixth, which you know a horrific event and and obviously a disturbing one even to cover. But you point out that there, for a large number of the Republican Party, he is still their guy, as you put it. And that's demonstrated in opinion polls as well as what Republican elected officials say. How worrying is that for American democracy? I think it's very worrying because he's an anti-democratic candidate. He's an anti-democracy candidate, not anti-democratic -party, party, anti-democracy candidate. He tried to overthrow um, the 2020 election. He tried mm. to claim he won when he did not win. And we're seeing in these hearings that he knew he didn't win, or he was told over and over again that he lost the election or that mm. there was no fraud or that it would be illegal or it, it would be illegal to pressure his vice president to overturn the election. His vice president didn't have the authority over mm. and over again. He was told, and yet he still kept going with it. He still kept telling his millions of supporters that there was fraud when there was no fraud, giving them a reason to believe that democracy was threatened and that they needed to do whatever it takes to to protect it. That's mm. a problem. Sure. And I think you have to ask yourself, do you want somebody who is anti-democracy in that office again, mm. holding all of that power? I would be worried. <laughs> right. As right. a citizen, certainly. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, sort of closing this off or, or, or closing the circle here, Katie, I just wanted to try to sort of reconnect the, the personal and the, and the professional, I suppose. You're uh, now mom to, to Teddy and Eloise, and you talk in the book about how that has changed you in, in lots of ways. I mean, you, you go into you know various experiences and your emotions regarding that, all of that. But you also talk about it in relation to motherhood's impact on, on how you experience stories, I suppose. I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but it's something about an extra layer of nerve endings or something to that effect. And we were just talking at the start about the fact that we seem to be in this succession of pretty upsetting stories in all kinds of ways. How do those... How do those dynamics, how are your nerve endings holding up, I guess, is what I'm actually trying to ask. You know, it's hard. It's hard. It's difficult. Um, it's always difficult to cover terrible news. But I think that I was able to keep some distance between myself and it uh, before I became a mom. After I became a mom, I, I suddenly physically felt some of the stories that I was covering. For instance, Uvalde. I physically felt the pain that I imagined those families were feeling. I, I, I think about kids being scared and I think about my own kids as any parent does and mm. it hurts, it hurts to do it. Um, so I, you know, how has it changed me? I think it's made me more empathetic. I think it's made me more sympathetic. I think it's made me more understanding um, of people 
and circumstances. And I think every experience that you accumulate in your life, whether it's having kids or traveling or experiencing problems with your insurance when you're trying to pay a medical bill or getting into a car accident, whatever experience you have in your life, I think helps you become a better journalist. The most important thing for us to do is to understand the world around us and everything we do, everything we we absorb should be put into our reporting lens mm. and helping the, the viewer or the, the reader understand an issue. Mm -hmm. And I think on that note, you know, it, it's worth saying that the, the empathy that you're talking about does feed into a lot of the things we've been talking about previously, right? Where does objectivity lie, you know, when it comes to the guns issue, when it comes to Uvalde? Yeah. Where, where is fairness located if the debate becomes, you know, are guns the problem or are doors in schools a problem, right? That's, a, that's yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, that's a, that's a hard question. Where is the objectivity? I think what you do is you, you again turn to facts and are guns a problem? Well, we're the only country that has this problem because we're the only country that doesn't regulate guns um, mm. in a meaningful way. And, you know, when we've seen this sort of violence in the UK or in Australia or other countries, they've taken steps to get rid of the guns or to crack down on who's able to own a gun. And this violence has gone away, mostly. Sure. Uh, that's not an opinion of mine. Those are hard, cold facts. So the guns, I think, do are the issue. The question is, how are we going to address it? Do we take all the guns off the streets? I, we've got a constitutional amendment that says, no, we can't do that. Do we more? Do we add more regulations to them? Well, Congress is trying. The Supreme Court might not uphold it, given what they just ruled for New York. It's going to be a moral question and a logistical question for this country for many years to come until there are enough voters out there to to make serious changes. And that might require enough voters to make a, a constitutional amendment. I'm not sure that anyone's ever going to have uh, that appetite. Uh, but if you're talking about guns, it's a really complicated issue because of the way that our constitution was written and how it's interpreted. So much more we could talk about, but we are out of time. Um, the book is Rough Draft. The publisher is Simon & Schuster. And the author is Katie Turr. Katie, thanks so much for your time. Niall, thank you very much for having me.